So I don't know how we're going to do this. I think what we'll do is um, just have questions direct from the floor. Please, not a statement. We've just got a chance to hear from someone who's been working day in and day out for the last 13 years for refugees. So statements out, questions, as challenging as you wish. Uh, so put up the hand. And when you, uh, if we've got a roving mic, I don't know if we have it, we'll stand up and just say it very loudly. And uh, 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 let's go. So, OK. Um, you talk about mobilising, disrupting, police state, all that stuff. Yeah. The Summer Offences Act, where you can't protest anymore, how's that going to affect all this? There's, you the Summer Offences Act, where sure. your right to protest is gone? Look, you can still protest. I mean, you look at today's Palm Sunday, that was a protest, people rallying. What we have to be clever about in how we protest is that it's non-violent protest. You know, non-violent protest in unexpected spaces from unexpected people actually has the ability to capture the public's imagination. So I think it's about us being savvy about that. Well, if we sit there, as much as we want to, and we're burning effigies or trying to rip down a fence, all you're going to see on the 6 o'clock news is us punching on with the police. The public looks and goes, look at that poor police officer, oh, look at that, look at that feral. We need to build a messaging in our protests and resistance that captures the imagination. And it can be done, it can be done non-violently and peacefully. Remember, that's what refugees are doing right here, right now. They are resisting constantly. So I think you can get around that. I think we get, we're sure there's pressures on it, but there's still great freedom to do that in this country, I believe. And you need to not be afraid to get arrested. Like, I'm planning to get arrested numerous times in the next year. <laughs> uh, my greatest hero, was, I didn't realize how many times he'd been arrested. Martin Luther King was arrested 33 times in his life. 33 times in his life. And he took something that was an object of shame in the African American community, made it an object of pride. You know, and it, more and more pressure on, on white America to sit there and go, people are looking at us and going, why are we arresting this man? Why are we arresting churchgoers? And there are ways to flip it, but we've got to be smart about it, strategic about it. Other questions? Thank you. Uh, I was just very interested in uh, your comments about the regional, uh, making this a bit more regional, country regional. Um, what intents or plans are there actually to take the, to the regional to small towns as well? Uh, do you mean regional here in Australia? Well, yeah, in Australia. What can we do in small towns? Sure. There's probably, there's probably three things I'm looking at in a regional community. One is going to be where when we're talking about working with schools and our hot potato campaign, we plan to also do that in regional towns. The second thing we're looking to do, uh, we uh, um, have just got a grant to try to do, to build a bit of a blueprint around the way in which we can tackle the hospitality, aged care and, and nursing shortage through using asylum seekers. And part of our framework is going to also look at how they can be an asset in regional rural communities. Like why can't we go to a model that says, we'll double, we'll triple, a refugee intake, we need to at least triple it based on numbers now and go. But in return, we might ask refugees to spend a couple of years in a regional rural communities, but we'll make sure there's infrastructure in place to ensure successful settlement outcomes. So we're also looking, we are inundated from regional businesses asking for labour. So we're looking at also how can we become a supplier of, of labour, how do we mobilise those communities. So when we, the hot potato, we're actually taking a different approach this year, which is when we go out to areas. How do we actually train people up to keep championing the issue? How do we provide support? How do we use regional rural communities to really be a powerful voice? Because there's a huge concern. And what's really interesting is regional rural communities are some of the best examples and pilots of the success of refugees that have revitalized the town. So how do we capture that success? How do we skill up those communities? And how do we also help them face the challenges they do? So there's some of the things we're looking at at the moment. So we're encouraging regional communities to come and talk to us and go, okay, well, how might we work together? It's all, it's all open, it's all possible. Question? Yeah, when um, in my country, in LA for instance, when, um, when someone is hired and they're illegal, they're often quite exploited. Yeah. And also there's, there's sort of a police state, as you're saying, yeah. and people who are employing people are considered illegal. They get in big trouble, yeah. all this kind of stuff. So how do you work the system? Sure. So you've got, to, you've got, I suppose, we have as a starting point, all asylum seekers in the Australian community are lawfully here. 
None of them have been legally come to this country. There's no such thing as an illegal asylum seeker. Once we accept that, we then have two groups, one with the right to work and one without the right to work, who have caught working and get placed in detention. Now, we can't put people at risk of that, and so that's why we're looking with our innovation hub of going, but they can volunteer. So let's get them job ready, skilled up, language ready, systems ready, network ready, so that when they're allowed to work, they're ready for that. And in the meantime, you actually do all that preventative stuff that prevents them from becoming unwell and fragmenting the communities breaking down. For those allowed to work, what we do there is we are very rigorous. We started the first employment program about a decade ago, and we run social enterprise in cleaning and catering and plan to add three more in our new home. And there it's about making sure that our people are paid at award wages and you regulate and monitor that. Because I know there are people looking at them for slave labour. Um, and again, there's a big enough network and there's enough systems we've got in place to manage that. So it's very much about going, uh, they're a resource, but they're not there as a slave resource. You know, like Gina Reinhardt's two dollars a day dream. Um, so that's how you do it. You manage it through good, good risk management systems. We have that. You partner with people. One of the things is about partnering with business that actually shares your vision and values. Because more and more in the global economy, what businesses stand for matters more and more to the consumer. So businesses can't afford to sit there and actually um, continue to act in these unethical ways. I know they are at the moment. But they're going to have to come to the table. So it's also about making sure that we partner with people that share our values. Because if they don't, you're going to get situations like that. Um, related to that, so I understand that there's an importance uh, in highlighting the economic value of yeah. refugees in yeah. Australia, um, filling that aging population gap and so forth. Do you think that there's a problem um, in using that argument side by side with a moral, compassionate argument to help the refugees because ultimately it might in some way undermine mm. that argument? And you said that you look for people, partners and business who share your values. Do you think that that is really the case? I hear a lot of professionals speaking about how we need to be fair to refugees because of the value they can bring to our economy. Yeah. And I think in a lot of ways that might be true, but it's secondary and ultimately negates yeah. um, trying to change the hearts and minds of Australians in a compassionate way. Look, I, I, I would say they can coexist. I, it's, it's, it's what you call segmentation, you know, and that idea is about recognizing. I don't like this language, but I'll use it for a second because it's a language that, that business uses to be successful, and there's a reason it uses this approach. It goes, I have something to offer the community. Now, if I present it in one particular way, this much of the community will, will buy that, will have that. But if I segment it, that is, I target different audiences, each with a different message that coexists, don't cannibalize. Don't undermine and don't dilute. I do it strategically and in a clever way. I actually grow my market. And to use that speak, I'm using that speak for, for a reason, which is we need to grow our market share. We need to actually get the majority of Australians giving a damn about refugees. And the fair go idea will only go so far. One dilutes the other if we actually put them in competition with one another. So when I'm having this conversation about segmentation, guys, I'm talking about how I speak to you tonight, to how I speak to a bunch of CEOs and, and multinationals, to how I speak to a group of church leaders, to how I speak to a group of young people, each one I will adapt my message to what resonates with them. That is just being strategic. It doesn't dilute the other. And I think if we keep getting hamstrung to the idea that it's got to be the moral argument, I would love to be in a world where that actually is all that's needed. But if we sit there as the left, as the human humanitarian movement and keep holding on to that, we're never going to get them. The right has no issue with diversifying. They do that for a reason, it works. So we as a left need to stop actually sitting there and going, well, what's legitimate and what's not, and go, what's going to actually work? And that's what that comes from. It comes from, I think, from a life now recognizing this isn't working. It's not cutting through. It's not cutting through. The data shows that, the polling shows that. Simply relying on morality and truth is not working. So that's why. But it doesn't have to cannibalize. I don't believe it actually does. Mm -hmm. First, thank you again. Every time you speak, it's so inspiring. The uh, question I have is around the Bund, uh, Jewish aid. Yep. Organizations are obviously keen to be involved. And, and the way you're, you're providing this information to us today is kind of wait for the ASRC to engage you. Yep. 
And yeah. if we want to be the ones that are coming to you yes. and not be part of the 3,000 you say not now, yeah. how do we do that? How do we get the Well, I think this is, one of the, this is one of the big challenges at the moment, which is exactly this. For us, in terms of what we're trying to do with the Food Justice Trial, the platform for compassion, the platform for advocacy innovation, are, is actually we're trying to open all this up to go, come, come. So, for example, the Food Justice Trial, if we come into your community, become one of the volunteers for it. Start plugging and promoting in your community. If you've um, got a school that's passionate about something, put your hand up and go, we want to be part of uh, this youth ambassador program. We want to own that space, we want to be part of it. With each of these things, what we're trying to do is, this is what's missing. We want to make ourselves redundant, and I want to put ourselves out of business. Now, the challenge is this. What the community is asking for and needing is a scalable infrastructure, an architecture, to allow you to be empowered to act. And so, what we're saying is, we're needing to, at the moment, just try to build that architecture. In the meantime, there is nothing stopping anyone from starting a social enterprise to help asylum seekers, starting an advocacy campaign, starting a petition. Everyone can go out there and go for it right now. So what we're trying to do is, how do we build an architecture that becomes open source, open source compassion in action, and go, we've built it, it's yours now. And that's the idea with everything we're doing. It's that it becomes open to everyone. So this platform of compassion I'm talking about, it's owned by the whole sector. Anyone can sign up, anyone can drive it. People can add more ideas. What we're looking at with young people is actually go, we want to actually ask young people, how do we change the, the attitudes of the nation? Kids, do it. Create your own film festival, create your own um, audio, your visual, your art, your stories. How are we going to get, where's the solution? So what we're just trying to do is build the platform that creates a tipping point that it goes, now it's your turn. <coughs> and we're not there. So in the meantime, of course, you're right. Um, we're one part of it. There are already thousands of people out there trying things. But our challenge and frustration is just not working. So what we're really trying to do is build a platform that then allows all of you to run with it and to have the tools, the technology and the access to do it yourselves so that we become irrelevant. That would be our greatest success. But where we haven't got it ready. But in the meantime, go for it. Go out there. And if you've got ideas, also come to us with ideas as well. This is what we're interested in, is building a community of thinkers that can help drive innovation. We just haven't got the architecture in place yet to manage that response. And that's what we're trying to do. Two more questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, have you heard of any strategies that are in place to try and plug the hole that's been created by the removal of free legal assistance? Yeah. So. In the list of, I, mean, I was tweeting earlier this year that 100 worst things, something wasn't done in the first 100 days, and one of it has been stripping legal assistance away from uh, asylum seekers, cutting out all legal help. And again, the challenge there becomes one of what do you do when suddenly 20,000 people no longer have access to lawyers? And again, that's one of the challenges around how do we do that innovatively? And this is what we're looking at at the moment is going. Can we create a technology platform that gives asylum seekers information? Should we be focusing on scalable things like widespread education? So if I'm sitting there and going, we don't have the lawyers to help a thousand Afghans, but what if we got those thousand Afghans in a room together with their community leaders and got them all the information at the same time? Or what if instead of getting more and more lawyers, you can take on maybe 50 people a year each, we actually got people who could coordinate a national um, legal network of hundreds of lawyers to reach all those people? That's what we're trying to figure out. I think what I'm getting at is we've got to think scale with everything now. We, we, can't, we can't do this anymore. We're the Kodak blockbuster of this world right now. Like as in, we're just getting, we're just being made redundant because the scale of need is so critical. And we're sitting there going, okay, where do I scrape together enough money to put someone in a rooming house for the night? And could we take on one more person to give legal advice to tonight? It doesn't work anymore. So this is what we're trying to look at, is about how do we use the community? Well, a simple idea I've got, I haven't had a go, I'm trying to put it in, is go, um, take five. And that's asking every lawyer in Australia to take five. Take five refugees. And if every lawyer in Australia took five refugees and took them on, every refugee in Australia is legally represented tomorrow. Take five. So it's, this is what I'm getting at. We're not the solution. I'm looking at our challenge being how do we build a platform that allows the community to be the solution. Because as long as charity thinks it's a solution, we're going to never get there. I'm a lawyer and I want to help you build that platform. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Right. Right. Good. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Last question for the night. Um, it's, it's incredible, like, the vision that you have and um, mobilising the community to overcome all the, the obstacles to yeah. create these large-scale yeah. solutions. And, and I believe so much can be done that way. But what about the huge roadblocks of things like immoral laws, like not being allowed to work, which yeah. is just the most fundamental yeah. block against so many of these things that you've mentioned? And these are the biggest challenges. I know, I know with, a, with a code of behaviour, as another example, we're looking at the viability of a high court challenge against that, so strategic litigation has got a role. The right to work is a more difficult one because it's one where, even though it constitutes persecution under the Refugee Convention to not let people work, it's one where legally a country is allowed to regulate and decide who can work or not. And unfortunately in those cases it's old-fashioned education, awareness, and trying to create a tipping point. But that's what I mean, that's where you need, that's where you need champions of business to be behind you. Because if you've got champions of business, being honest with you, it's one thing for me to sit there and say, but it's another thing we've got the Business Council of Australia on Tony Abbott's door going. We've got a 40,000 labour shortage. These people are in our community. We need these people. Let them work. So that's a little challenge. They, they are really difficult. It's the same with how they're going to be closed in Nauru and Manus Island. And this is the challenge about, when you talk about the idea of the elephant, is about how do you, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So we've also got to think big and not, you know, we need to end mandatory detention. We need to close down these places. But we also need to think, what are the things we do now that destabilise those things, to take away the sustainability? How do we destroy it from the inside? And the challenge is, as long as we sit there and our attention is on another rally, another petition, another protest, to close Manus Island, which needs to be there, we need it to be in people's attention and mind. But if that's all we've got to the table, the right is looking at us and laughing, going, yeah, all the best, all the best. Go, keep, keep going, having those protests. People, the, the strains that, that are voting for us on either side of the political fence don't care. So how do we embed refugees into Australian society like refugees have been over 700,000 since the time of Federation? How do we embed refugees that they are everywhere in this country as icons of hope, compassion, success, possibility, and that we look at it as our greatest thing to be proud of? And it's a hell of a long way to go. Now, when we can't do that with our Indigenous Australians, our first people, it is no wonder we are so appalling with our most recent Australians. It's a long way to go, but we've got to start building. And there are lots of other solutions. I've given you some examples of where we're going and what I would like to do with people such as you, where we can go together. Because it's about we. It's not about I or about the ASRC. See, I was giving you an example of it. So I'm talking concrete stuff. But it's about where are we going? No one can do it on their own. No organisation can get there. No one leader can get there. We need to do this together. And so what we need are more people putting up their hand and go, I'll take that little bit. And it's possible. You just need each person to put up their hand and go, I'll take that little bit and, and drive that for you. Let's go. And imagine if we could do that in, on the scale of millions. It becomes such a force of compassion that it overwhelms. It overwhelms the abyss of apathy and tyranny. Because it just, it, it, that's how you beat down hate. You beat it down with love. But you've got to build it at a scale that, that there's no resistance left that's possible to, to take that down. We need, we need millions of us out there. And that's what we've got to build. Thank you. Thank you.